All right. Um, good morning, everybody. This is um, this is uh, Wednesday, <laughs> January nineteenth, um, and we are here this morning on H ninety six. H ninety six was uh, introduced to us last year as a short form bill, and it was introduced as a short form bill uh, because. Uh, the concept of what a Truth and Reconciliation Commission had not yet been fully discussed or developed, and um, so we wanted to get the conversation started, especially in conjunction or to follow the idea of the apology, which happened, and now we're at a position of, of following up that apology with other actions, which may include a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, may include other issues that are in bills that are before us um but we're beginning work on this so i wanted to bring back the two sponsors representative colson is with us in 3d um, <laughs> representative christie is with us uh via via zoom um I think what we'll do, uh, Representative Colson, just because this is really the first 3D meeting, you know, you're you're like the first outside witness. Sure. Um, I'd like to go around the room. It's our tradition to introduce everybody in the room while we're here. So um, we'll start with Representative Byron, and then we'll do the people in the room, and then the people on the screen, and then we'll get going. Okay. All right. Come on. Uh, Representative Matt Byron, Regents, represent Northwest Addison County. Good to see you. Good to be here. Good morning. I'm Representative Lisa Hango, and I represent the northern border of Vermont, Highgate, Franklin, Berkshire, and Richford. I'm Re Representative <laughs> Tiff Bloomley, and I represent the south end of Burlington. Representative Hal Colston, I represent Winooski and a sliver of Burlington. Representative Joe Parsons, I represent Newberry Thompson. John Vlasic, I represent Melton. Good to see you again. Good to see you. And Coach Christie. <laughs> Representative Barbara Murphy, I serve Fairfax, Franklin, too. And Representative Tom Stevens, I represent Waterbury, Bolton, Huntington, and Buells Gore. Uh, Representative Kalaki. From South Burlington. Welcome, everybody. Representative Triano. He's reading. Representative Wall. <laughs> oh, there it is. Two, two clicks. Uh, Representative Walls representing Barry City. And Representative Howard. Good morning. I'm Representative Mary Howard, and I represent the southwest part of Rutland City. And Representative Christie. Representative Kevin Coach Christie representing Hartford and the five villages therein. Thank you. Okay, that's a bit of an awkward way of going around the room, but <laughs> we'll acclimate. I think yeah, I think the difference between us, you know, before times and Zoom times is simply that um, in Zoom everybody's already identified, but here we are just in the room. So. Um, so welcome, Representative Colston. If you'd like to just, um, as a kind of a sponsor, co-sponsor with Coach Christie, if you can, do, if you can just take us through kind of a reintroduction to what your vision of this bill is. Sure. And then we'll have, um, uh, we do have a version, an amendment to the short form, and, and the attorney, uh, Damien, is here with us to walk through it. Great. Well, thank you for, for having me. Um, and as uh, Chair Stevens stated, um, this bill started out as a short form bill. And the intent um, was to be able to uh, eventually stand up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, in its earliest uh, design, the, the thought was to have a development task force that would explore what this might look like, make recommendations for future legislation. But once um, the bill came to this committee, there was a, a concerted effort to, to really look at, well, what, what would it take just to stand up the commission? 
uh, as opposed to going through uh, extra steps, time, and resources. The, the reason that I think this bill is important, um, we're already seeing proposed bills to deal with reparations. And even in Burlington, there's uh, some strong efforts underway to deal with reparations with regards to chattel slavery. So I think eventually uh, this body will be tasked with going down that path. And I believe um, it's important to establish the why. Why is this needed, reparations? And I think a truth and reconciliation process will um, bring voices together, um, those who have been harmed by our systemic systems of racism and discrimination, um, to have a deeper understanding of, of the harm that's been caused and what might be possible to repair that harm. So um, TRC, um, as we all know, had its origins in South Africa many years ago. And since then, many countries and here in, in the US states and even cities have taken on truth and reconciliation processes. So that was really the intent of this bill is to um, establish kind of a baseline of understanding of, of, of why um, reparations is an important thing to consider. And I think for people to get their, 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 their heads wrapped around this, I think a TRC process will, will get us there. When um, the one word that always hangs up is truth. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> What does it mean to determine one's truth? I, I, think, I think having a space that's created um, to allow those voices to be heard and felt and, and to express their truth with regards to the impact of our history, um, in particular here in Vermont, uh, of how past policies and practices have, have harmed certain groups of people. And I think it's, it's certainly important for the oppressed to share that, but, in, but more importantly for the oppressor to hear and feel and understand what was done. So, so that truth becomes, I think, that, that, that kernel of, of, of hope in order for us to do something different and to do something to, to reconcile, to repair, to to bring us together as, as Vermonters to, to move forward. The, and we'll hear how um, the, the draft you know, mm -hmm. plays out, but you did mention that there's a, you know, there's two, there's a bunch of parallel paths it seems that's developing, which is one is a, one is a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, one might be reparations, one mm -hmm. might be discrimination laws that we've taken testimony on already this year. When, um, do you view them to be linear processes? Like, do you have to have one before you have the other? Or do you view these things just constantly working in, in balance? I, I, I really think it's the, the latter. And I think that um, when, when our uh, constituents start speaking out and, and asking and demanding that we take action, um, <clears throat> I don't think it's wise to, to postpone that, but to um, understand how that can hopefully support this effort of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, so that we can all understand how these all are connected and can take us forward if we do the work. Okay, um, Representative Christie, do you have um, words you would like to share that would complement Representative Colson? Uh, I, I think Representative Colson did a, an incredible job uh, prefacing you know, the discussion. Uh, the only thing I'd like to add is uh, a tale 
uh, to the uh, constituent piece. Uh, last night, fairly late, <laughs> I was on a call uh, with several uh, constituents uh, from the BIPOC community. And a number of our BIPOC brothers and sisters in the state feel that yesterday wasn't soon enough to start this, this, this discussion. Um, and growing a little weary of being patient. Um, and as you can imagine, after 619 years, uh, you know, patience can run a little thin. Um, so that would be the only addendum that I would add to, uh, you know, our discussion. Uh, and it isn't in a mean spirited, you know, sense, you know, of, of the word. It's like, come on, let's get moving. You know, we've heard it'll take time for a long time. So, um, that was where the, uh, uh, the conversation uh, ended last night. Uh, and I think that we're on the right path. Uh, and I hope that we can come up with a uh, proposal from your committee that will move us forward. So thank you very much. And I really appreciate the attention that uh, House General is giving this work. Yes, sir. If I could add, uh, Representative Christie's um, comments reminded me of, uh, of, of some words from civil rights activist Fannie Lou Hamer, who once said, we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. <laughs> so how do we move forward and begin this healing process? Uh, I think I appreciate you coming in and, and re and you know restating the you know the mission of the bill. Um, I know that we've had conversations through for two years now, mm -hmm. and um, it's it's not enough to say it's not enough time. And as Coach, as as Representative Christie just made clear, but it's. Um, it's it's an interesting. I think when we hear when we hear this draft, you know, we'll hear the problem that we're trying to solve mm -hmm. very clearly. Mm -hmm. So I thank you for for reintroducing the bill. You're welcome to stay while while the uh, while Damien uh, does a walkthrough of the bill, and um, and then we'll take questions after that and have a you know quick discussion, and then we'll see where we go next with this. Mr. Okay. Chair? Yes. Uh, uh, before we uh, jump off uh, back to our respective uh, committees, uh, if I could just add uh, before we get started, for those who haven't been uh, directly working in the subcommittee uh, with House General, uh, I'd like to thank expressly uh, Chair Stevens, uh, Representative Bloomley, and Representative Kalaki, who've been working, oh geez, over time, you know, on trying to help formulate this draft. Uh, there's been a lot of research uh, that went into this. Uh, they've had um, interns doing work. Uh, the Council of State Governments, you know, has helped all of us in preparing, you know, this draft with uh, uh, Attorney Leonard uh, and also our Human Rights Commission Executive Director was actively involved in putting uh, this document together. So it, it's been uh, a Vermont effort mm. uh, with a lot of history from around the world, actually. And we took testimony from, you know, our Native American brothers and sisters in Canada, even. So uh, I, I'm really proud of the work that you've done uh, thus far. And I just needed to put a shout out 
to our colleagues. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, Representative Christie. I'm sorry, I've got to get back into like <laughs> the, formal, <laughs> the formal thing here. Um, um, thank you again, uh, Representative Colston. You're, you're welcome to stay um, or get back to, I don't know, you guys are, you guys don't have much. Well, I, I, I could enjoy a break, so I'll stick around. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You're on government operations, <laughs> so I imagine that you've worked overtime as well. Um, Represent, uh, Representative uh, uh, Damien, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go. So, yeah, uh, with due respect to everyone in this room, uh, no thank you. I'm not interested in elected office. <laughs> uh, I think the pay cut would be devastating. Pretty catastrophic. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, thank you for the record, uh, Damien Leonard, Legislative Council. Uh, do you want me to go right to the amendment draft or to start with the underlying bill? Um, if you could start with the underlying bill, we built in time for, for that. All right, let me just pull up that bill and then. Where's the draft? It's uh, 1.3. If you go to today's. Oh, it's in today's. Yeah. Okay. Today is. Come on, Matt. But we're doing the underlying bill first, as introduced. All right. So I shared it on the screen as well. Thank uh, you. So this is, as uh, Representative Colston and Representative Christie mentioned, this was started out as a short form bill. Uh, and the bill proposed to create a Truth and Reconciliation Commission Development Task Force. Uh, to develop and submit to the General Assembly a proposal for legislation to create one or more truth and reconciliation commissions to examine and begin the process of dismantling institutional, structural, and systemic discrimination in Vermont, both past and present. Um, so that is one thing to just note here is that this looked at the possibility of a task force that would design um, proposals for one or more truth and reconciliation commissions that would then have to be acted on by this body. Uh, the task force would be composed of both voting and non-voting members with the voting members, including representatives of historically disadvantaged or, and disenfranchised groups that have suffered from institutional, structural and systemic discrimination in our state. Uh, and then the non-voting members would have included legislative members. And the reason for this was to uh, ensure that the voices at the table uh, who had a vote in the final proposal put forward represented the groups that the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions were designed to help begin the process of uh, hearing about the discrimination suffered both past and present, but then adding in non-voting legislative members so that there was a voice and champions within the building here who had been participating in the process uh, and bringing their knowledge of sort of the legislative process to the table there to help inform the conversation. And then also being able to bring uh, their participation in that conversation back into the building for when we develop the legislation. So that was the underlying proposal. Are there questions on that? I guess I have a question if that's okay. Um, so after something would come out of this <clears throat> vote, it would come to the legislature and then be formed into a bill and go through the regular process of the bill? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. So very similar to what we've done in the past with uh, issues like merging the Lottery Commission and the Department of Liquor Control, where it was a big issue and there are concerns about uh, would there be enough time in a session? So if you form a separate task force, you can just focus on that issue and then have the, the process sort of uh, have a head start on it when you get back to a legislative session so that you can form something. Um, and so I think the, 
the draft you're going to see comes out of the conversations that occurred during the off session this year, which jump started that task forces process. Yes. I have another question to follow up on that. Um, the task force, can you remind me if that was um, in the resolution that we passed that a task force would be formed? No, I don't think that was specifically addressed by the resolution. Um, this was thought of uh, as one of the further steps um, that would be a follow up to that resolution. And in that case, that task force, um, I assume, is very informal. So those meetings were not recorded, or I, that might be a question for Representative Colston or Wimley or Chris. No, the, the task, there wasn't, there wasn't a task force by name. It was the, the representative Kalaki and representative Bloomley expressed an interest in working on the bill as if we were working on any other bill throughout, you know, for, for introduction. So it wasn't an official, um, it wasn't an official summer study committee or summer task force. They weren't, there wasn't, it wasn't a question of being paid. This was, this was work that they took on that they expressed an interest in and that I let them just said, if this is what you want to do with your summer, then this is the homework, you know, this is the research that you can do um, on your own volunteer and on your own. This is, this is the work that they, and then they, as legislators, are allowed to ask the attorney to create a bill. And that's, and in this case, it's an amendment to, um, to this bill. So this bill really wouldn't even be necessary, H96, if the the group has already been meeting and has already come up with draft 1.3. Right, so the, the proposal you see in front of you would be a strike all amendment, replacing the underlying draft with uh, a task force proposal, um, rather than doing the task force and then coming back with a proposal. Um, I was asked to draft up the proposal that they came up with um, based on their work during the off session. And H96 was submitted last year or? Yep. Yeah, okay, that, that all makes sense. Yeah, so it's first year of the biennium and then. And then, and then just the, as, as, a, as a further aside to this, so the title, the, the title of H96 with the Commission Development Task Force is something that will probably change Mm -hmm. with the introduction of, of the um, amendments that come forward. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I remember to include a title change at the end of the amendment, um, but that would be something that you, if you move this forward, I would recommend to changing the title. Um, otherwise, it would be pretty misleading for folks who are looking to see what we did over the year um, and to see you know, the development task force rather than the actual um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission if you move this forward. So. And so um, I think for our purposes today, if you know, we allowed Damien to walk through the bill, hold our questions to the end, and then spend some time with questions on this um, would probably be the best, the best form for today. Sure. Okay, well, I'm going to share the amendment with you now. Uh, and this should be posted on the committee's webpage at this point. Um, so this is a standard strike all amendment. Um, and because it's a short form bill, there's no real text that we're striking out. Um, so this is the standard way that we fill in text on a short form bill anyway. Uh, so it would add section one, which is an intent section, providing that it's the intent of the General Assembly to establish uh, the Vermont uh, Truth and Reconciliation. I think that should be, oh yeah, Truth and Reconciliation Task Force to examine and begin the process of dismantling institutional, structural, and systemic discrimination in Vermont, both past and present and that it would be composed of members of historically disadvantaged racial, indigenous, and tribal populations that have suffered from institutional, structural, and systemic discrimination. So you'll see uh, that language is echoing the, the original uh, purpose language. 
Section two creates in a uh, permanent statute uh, because this will be going on for several years rather than just for one summer. Uh, this adds chapter 25 to title one uh, and it would be the truth and reconciliation task force. Uh, section 901 uh, of that new chapter creates and establishes the task force as a body corporate and politic known as the Vermont Truth and Reconciliation Task Force to carry out the provisions of this chapter. This is standard language that we use when we're establishing an independent subdivision of the state. We use this language for uh, the Housing and Conservation Board, the Student Assistance Corporation, et cetera. Um, so this is establishing it as an independent body of the state. The Truth and Reconciliation Task Force is constituted a public instrument instrumentality exercising public and essential government functions and the exercise by the task force of the power conferred by this chapter shall be deemed and held to be the performance of an essential governmental function. Again, this is the boilerplate language that we use to establish these bodies. The subsection B describes the 14 members who are currently proposed to be members of the task force. Uh, this is something that uh, is definitely uh, a, a policy question to be discussed by the committee if you move forward. Who would be on the task force? How many people should there be? The current proposal is for 14 members, including the executive De director of racial equity or designee, the executive director of the human rights commission or designee, and 12 members to be jointly appointed by the governor, the president pro tem of the Senate and the speaker of the house. I'll pause right there just to note that that appointment structure is unusual um, for uh, any state body. Uh, I am not sure if we've used it in the past. It is, it is definitely unusual, but it, it is possible that you could have that uh, structure go forward. The challenge with that is the potential if they disagree and can't reach agreement on some of the members. So just something to keep in mind. Um, but there are a variety of ways that you can uh, get at the appointment. This looks at joint appointment and uh, with the sort of idea of everybody coming together uh, on a consensus. So the first four members would represent the Native American Indian tribes that are recognized by the state pursuant to one VSA chapter 23 with one member from each recognized tribe who would be appointed in consultation with the Commission on Native American Affairs. Uh, the second grouping here is two members who identify as Native American, but who are not members of tribes recognized by the state pursuant to one VSA chapter 23. Uh, and then the final six individuals are six individuals with experience working to implement racial justice reforms or representing communities of color in Vermont who shall be appointed in consultation with the Legislative Social Equity Caucus. Uh, so just backing up here, the first four members are in consultation with the Commission on Native American Affairs. The last six are in consultation with the Legislative Social Equity Caucus, and the middle two are selected without consultation uh, with outside bodies, and they would be done in the normal way that uh, you seek appointees where uh, individuals could express interest to the speaker, the president pro tem, and the governor, and then they would discuss, um, and they could also seek out individuals that they believe would uh, serve well in that role. Um, so again, with as with the other things, the consultation could be changed. You could add groups to consult with. Uh, you could remove groups who are being consulted with and so forth. The next uh, subdivision two here speaks to the members of the task force uh, and the requirements to be a member. So each member who is appointed shall be a resident of Vermont, shall have knowledge of the problems and challenges facing racial, indigenous, and tribal populations in Vermont, shall have experience advocating in relation to the issues of racial, indigenous, and tribal populations in Vermont, 
and shall have demonstrated leadership in programs or activities to improve opportunities for racial, indigenous, and tribal populations in Vermont. So uh, this is really narrowing down the requirements uh, to be a member of the task force and focusing on people who have ad advocated and worked for uh, or on issues of racial, indigenous, or tribal equity. Um, the next subdivision here, B, provides that to the extent possible, members of the task force shall come from diverse backgrounds and represent geographically diverse areas of the state. This is aspirational language, um, but it, it's language that we've started including in more and more uh, groups that the legislature creates. And it's looking to represent not only diverse backgrounds, which can mean a number of things, socioeconomic, educational, uh, work backgrounds, as well as racial, religious, um, et, et cetera, and also representing geographically diverse areas of the state. So we're aiming not to have, for example, 12 members from Chittenden County or something like that. We're aiming to spread people around the state, understanding that Vermont's different regions have different, different needs, different histories, different experiences. Um, and then the, the next piece here is providing that a majority of the members shall be members of a racial, indigenous, or tribal population in Vermont. So it doesn't require all of the members, but it does require a majority of the members to be uh, members of those populations. Uh, again, these are requirements that can be tweaked, adjusted, added to, um, or trimmed back as the committee sees fit. So the next section here, because this is going to be an ongoing group, uh, there is the concern that what if you appoint someone and they fail to actually fulfill their duties? Um, and so this provides that members of the task force may be removed by the appointing authority for incompetency, failure to discharge their duties, malfeasance, or illegal acts. So really what we're looking at here are uh, the, the first two deal with uh, how well they're doing their, their job as a member of the task force. And then the second two are looking at are they engaging in inappropriate conduct outside of their work in the task force. Um, for example, it could be harmful to the credibility of the task force if one of the members uh, was uh, convicted of a felony while serving on the task force, and then you would have a public trust issue. So at that point, um, however unlikely that is, you would want to have the authority to remove them and then replace them with someone else um, to avoid those concerns. Uh, and this is similar language to what we use for uh, state boards where people are appointed for multi-year terms. Uh, and then what this is doing is it's really narrowing the causes for removal. So you'll notice what's not included here is that the appointing authority disagrees with a position that that individual is advocating for on the task force. Um, and then uh, vacancy occurring during the term shall be filled by the appropriate appointing authority for the remainder of the unexpired term. Uh, annually, the task force would select the chair and a vice chair from among its members. Uh, this allows the task force, if for example, someone serves as a chair for a year and then uh, is worn out from that work, they could step down and someone else could step in to fill that role. Um, and then meetings would be held at the call of the chair or at the request of five or more members. So not a majority of the task force, um, but still a significant number of task force members could call a meeting if the chair uh, was not willing to call the meeting on their own. And then a majority of the current membership would constitute a quorum. So you need eight members based on this current draft. Um, but then actions could be authorized by a majority of the members present and voting at a meeting. Uh, and that's fairly standard uh, language for bodies like this. And then a requirement that the task force meet not less than 10 times per year. Um, so this is looking for them to be meeting on an almost monthly basis during their existence. 
uh, and nothing prevents them from meeting more often than that. Uh, so you'll notice here uh, in subsection F, uh, we've not withstood the standard per diem language, and we're providing that members shall be entitled to per diem compensation of blank amount. Uh, the feeling and drafting this was that they should be entitled to more than the $50 per day because working on a truth and reconciliation commission involves a lot of uh, emotionally uh, and mentally difficult work and may also involve a lot of work outside of the official meetings. Uh, but the uh, when we were working on the draft, there wasn't a number that folks were ready to settle on. So this is left blank and just highlighted as something that for the committee to consider uh, and come up with an alternative amount or come up with an amount, excuse me. Um, and then plus reimbursement of expenses for attendance at meetings. Uh, and this is something that uh, the committee will probably wanna take testimony on. There are different models for these task forces. Uh, some of the task forces constituted in other places are professional, where you have full-time members, but a smaller membership. And others are citizen boards where it's broader membership like this proposal, and they're, they're compensated on a per diem basis uh, for their, their work. So these are different models you could consider, and you could look at what the per diems are from some of the different models. Section 902 creates the powers and duties of the task force. Subsection A is the duties. Uh, the first is to conduct research necessary to determine the current status of the historically disadvantaged racial, indigenous, and tribal populations, including qualitative and quantitative examination of data related to things like business ownership, household assets, income, and debt, housing, land ownership, employment, education, healthcare, access to benefits, and access to wealth and capital. This is a broad list of topics to research, uh, certainly something for the committee to look at uh, as you're figuring out whether this is appropriately broad, is it too broad, is it too narrow, um, or are there things that are left off this list? Um, but this was the list that was come up with in the initial draft. Uh, the next is to develop and implement a process for truth and reconciliation to address the institutional, structural, and systemic discrimination experienced by the historically disadvantaged populations, both past and present. And this is recognizing that we, we don't have this process for truth and reconciliation right now in Vermont. Uh, and so step one for this task force is going to be establishing that process. How are we going to conduct our meetings? How are we going to conduct interviews? How are we going to reach out to these populations? How are we going to dig into state records and state archives um, in order to determine uh, you know, the, um, the sort of documentary facts surrounding uh, historic practices within the state that have affected these populations and so forth. Number three is to promote, implement, and coordinate programs and activities to create and improve opportunities for or to eliminate disparities experienced by members of the historically disadvantaged populations. So this is looking at uh, the reconciliation part um, and looking at uh, promoting and implementing or coordinating programs to help uh, with the process of reconciliation as you uh, develop that truth during the work on the of the task force. The powers for the task force to carry out their duties. Um, so one is to adopt rules pursuant to the Administrative Procedure Act as necessary to implement the provisions of this chapter. Two is to adopt procedures um, as necessary to carry out the duties. So rules are, um, that's got, uh, sort of a binding force of law with respect to how the, the task force carries out its work. Procedures are essentially, you know, what are the steps you follow when you're collecting evidence, when you're hearing testimony, when you're conducting hearings? 
and it doesn't necessarily need to go through the drawn out process of notice and comment that's required for rulemaking. So it's just two different levels. Uh, third is to establish and maintain a principal office. Uh, fourth is to meet and hold hearings at any place in the state. Uh, five is to issue subpoenas uh, to compel testimony or access to a production of records, documents, and other, other evidence or possible sources of evidence or the appearance of persons provided that the subpoena is issued pursuant to an investigation commenced by the task force pursuant to this chapter and that there is reasonable cause to believe that those materials or the testimony are relevant to that investigation. This language is drawn from the Human Rights Commission. Uh, and what this does is it prevents the task force from being stonewalled by uh, a state agency or another entity that doesn't want to uh, share records that may be related to uh, an issue it's, it's causing. Um, a lot of the records that they're going to be dealing with are potentially sensitive. Uh, and so this allows them to get access to those records. It also creates a process for uh, a body to say, no, you've gone too far, and then to have uh, a neutral party in the courts adjudicate uh, whether this is an appropriate request for records. So um, this is... Uh, this is something that is available to quasi-judicial panels uh, in the state. And again, it's available through the judicial system and is something that's used in discovery. And for example, a civil case, uh, you might issue subpoenas for records that are being withheld or for testimony when someone's not willing to provide that testimony. Um, this is... Uh, this includes notice that the individual has the right to contest the subpoena. Uh, and then the initial uh, right to contest the subpoena is before not less than half of the task force. And then that they can bring that uh, appeal of the subpoena to a court. And then that this would be enforced in the same way that a subpoena under our Administrative Procedure Act is enforced. So, that sets out existing procedures for a state entity that has subpoena power to bring a subpoena and then attempt to enforce it and have a court determine whether the subpoena is appropriate or whether it should be quashed. Uh, the next uh, power is to consult with local, national, and international experts on issues related to truth and reconciliation and restorative justice. Uh, so this is acknowledging that uh, we're following in the footsteps of other bodies that have been doing this work, and this allows the, the panel the power to consult with those experts as it develops its process, and also as it moves through its process and develops proposals uh, for the legislature. Uh, uh, the next power here uh, is almost doesn't need to be said. Uh, it's to hear testimony from members of historically disadvantaged populations, uh, members of the public, and persons with knowledge of institutional, structural, and systemic discrimination experienced by uh, those populations. And this is, this is really the core mission of this body. Um, the next is to study research, investigate, and report on the impact of state actions in relation to the historically disadvantaged populations. And if the task force determines that the actions constitute institutional, structural, and systemic discrimination against uh, a population or populations, regardless of whether it was intentional or, uh, or adversely impacted the population, the task force can propose legislative or administrative action to either the General Assembly or the governor uh, to remedy the impacts on the population. So this is part of the reconciliation process uh, for the panel here. So if they determine that there was uh, a particular action uh, that was discriminatory and affected a particular population, they can propose uh, some sort of action to remedy that, whether that's uh, 
something that's within the governor's executive authority or something that requires legislation uh, and then bring it to the appropriate body. The next couple are based on their powers as an independent state entity. So the first is to enter into cooperative agreements with private organizations or individuals or with any agency or instrumentality of the United States or this state to carry out the provisions of this chapter. Uh, so this allows them to uh, work with consultants, to work with individuals who are uh, experienced uh, in this work, um, as well as to work with, for example, a body like the uh, the EEOC or the Human Rights Commission or uh, any number of other private organizations that work on issues of uh, racial equity or racial justice uh, that might be able to help them in, in uh, fulfilling their mission. Number 10 is to make and execute legal documents necessary or convenient for the exercise of its powers and duties under this chapter. This is, goes along with there being an independent uh, entity with the authority to carry out their mission. Number 11 allows them to hire consultants and independent con contractors to assist the task force. And number 12 is to take any other actions necessary to carry out the provisions of this chapter. This is catch all language um, that basically says, if there's something that's necessary to do your job, uh, and to carry out the requirements of this chapter, such as the next section, hiring an executive director, uh, you can take that action. Uh, we don't have to enumerate it in here specifically. Um, but it also is limited that it has to be necessary to carry out the provisions of the chapter. So they can't do something that you know is, is not related to their mission as the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Task Force. So uh, section 903 gives the task force the authority to appoint and, and requires them to appoint an executive director who has to be an individual with experience in relation to racial justice or advocating on behalf of historically disadvantaged groups. The executive director would be a full-time state employee exempt from the classified service and would serve at the pleasure of the task force. This is very similar to uh, Bo Yang's role over at the Human Rights Commission as executive director. Uh, she is a state employee. She's exempt from the classified service uh, and she serves at the, the pleasure of the commission or uh, Bryn Hare over at the Cannabis Control Board. So the same thing um, where she's appointed by the board and then serves at their pleasure and is really their, their full-time uh, staff person who runs the office. Um, the executive director is responsible for supervising and administering the implementation of the provisions on behalf of the task force, assisting the task force in carrying out its duties, employing staff as necessary to carry out the duties of the task force, and preparing an annual budget for submission to the task force, which would then, uh, if they approve that budget, uh, submit it to the governor for inclusion in the budget proposal in the same way that the independent bodies currently existing within a state government do. Um, so a uh, couple of important things to note here. So uh, numbers one and two there uh, relate to the fact that this is a citizen uh, task force, and then they would have professional staff to assist them in carrying out their duties. Um, these staff could include uh, attorneys, social scientists, uh, social workers, uh, administrative staff, researchers, uh, paralegals, other folks like that who can help them with research, can help them with interviewing uh, individuals, uh, can help them with crafting proposed legislation, um, organizing hearings, drafting agreements, et cetera. Uh, number three, oh, we already covered that. So. Um, number section 904 provides for two different reports. One is an annual report uh, on or before January 15th each year, which is basically an update on what did you do this past year? What were your findings? Do you have any interim recommendations for, uh, for action? 
um, to further the mission of the task force or to address instances of discrimination that you've identified. Um, and then the final report is scheduled for on or before June 15th of 2025. So there would be uh, three annual reports in, in January of 2023, 2024, and 2025, and then a final report in June of 2025. Uh, which would detail the full findings of the task force and recommend actions to address instances of discrimination that the task force identified. Section 905 creates a special fund for the task force. Uh, this would, uh, the fund would be, uh, would consist of uh, appropriations from the state and then any gifts or grants received by the, the task force. So the task force could seek out grants from outside organizations to further its work. Uh, and then the fund would be available to the task force to carry out its duties. Uh, and then interest on the fund balances would be credited to the fund. That's a provision that the committee uh, may want to consider further. It's a provision we add a lot. Depending on the size of the fund, it may actually cost more for the state to keep the interest in the fund and do the accounting, then you would actually earn interest on the fund. So that's just something to flag there. Um, the accounting for these funds is actually fairly expensive um, because the uh, there are literally hundreds of special funds within the state and each one they need to track the interest. And then if it's reverting to the fund, they have to credit that back to the fund and so forth. Um, so, and when you're earning interest at you know, whatever the ridiculously low amount is, fraction of 1%, <laughs> it, it may not actually be that much money. Section three is a prospective repeal of the task force. So this would repeal it on July 1 of 2025. So it would really be a three-year task force. And the effective date would be July 1, 2022. So that's when it would be established. One thing to note, is uh, that with the July 1 establishment date, you may want to set a deadline for appointment of the members um, because otherwise uh, one of the, the issues we have here is that after we adjourn, uh, it's very hard to get people together unless there's a deadline. Uh, so you could see a three or four month delay in actually getting members appointed and getting the task force to a point where it can function. Um, so that's, that's just something else to keep in mind, uh, with the task force. So I'll take questions. Um, I see Representative Wallace and then Hango. And then after these two questions, I want to take a break. Uh, thank you for that, Chair Stevens. I could use a break. Uh, I have a question about the composition of the task force and, uh, I'm thinking, especially here in Barrie, but applies to many communities in Vermont, at be the beginning of the 20th century, oh, excuse me, what I'm thinking is about the immigrant population. So at the beginning of the 20th century, for example, here in Barrie, French Canadians and Italians came to work in the quarries and they were not always greeted with open arms. And in, in some cases that was because of religious differences. But more recently, uh, in Barrie and other communities, we had Bosnians, groups of Bosnians arrived, ethnic Turks from Russia who were a different religion, often didn't speak the language. And of course, now we have folks from Afghanistan coming in, and I don't know what sort of issues they're facing. Um, so I'm just wondering if maybe there should be representation of the immigrant population and I, I would bet Representative Colston might have thoughts on that since his community has significant immigrant uh, populations, lots of folks from Asia, for example. Uh, so I'm just throwing that out. I wonder if, if there should be somebody representing immigrants. So I think this is a better question for uh, either Representative Christie, Representative Colston, or uh, Representative Lumley or Kalaki. Um, and I think it's I think it's a political decision. So it's you know I mean that's a you know it, it coming from 
during the conversation about who might be included. I mean, I have a question about flexibility that I'll ask after the break, but which may talk about that um, representative wall. So we'll, we'll, um, but I do think that's a political choice of how big the umbrella is for these, for, for this kind of study. Um, Representative Hengo. Thank you. I have a few questions. One of them should be really easy to answer. Did I miss somewhere in here the length of a person's term that's serving on this task force? You you did not, um, but that is a that is a good catch. Uh, the term is currently set up as as the full length on the task force, but it, it should be spelled out okay. uh, in there. I noticed that as I was going through. Okay, and in um, um, in relation to that, also then, um, what about legislative members who may not be reelected during that time period? They are non voting members, but. Oh, so the, that was taken out. Um, so that was in the original underlying proposal. And in this, the membership doesn't uh, depend on uh, your being a member of the legislature, although the appointing authority could change if we get a new speaker or pro tem. Um, so the, this, the amendment draft proposes four representatives of the recognized tribes two other uh, representatives of Native Americans in Vermont that who are not members of the tribes, and then six members with a background um, in racial justice work. Okay. Um, I missed that, yeah. sorry. Nope, I that's was, okay. It's going from the original. It, <laughs> it's confusing when you okay. um, swap back and forth between the two, especially when you have something that would run through two bienniums. Mm -hmm. um, and I see that I even took notes before we started saying draft 1.3, sorry. Um, my last question is really um, that um, multiple populations could be served by a bill such as this. So could this bill be used to set up more than one truth and reconciliation task force for specific things. Like for instance, if we wanted to investigate reparations for slavery, that would be one task group or for reparations for the eugenics legislation, that would be a separate one. Right, so this, this particular draft focuses on the issue of, of uh, racial discrimination, um, whether that's against uh, uh, racial minorities or indigenous or tribal populations in Vermont. Um, and the you could have a, a task force focused on specifically the issue of populations impacted by eugenics. Um, or you could also have uh, you know a task force focused on discrimination against immigrants like Representative Waltz brought up. Um, the, the choice here was to focus on the racial discrimination aspect, um, but there's nothing that prevents us from setting up multiple task forces um, or, uh, you know, uh, setting up a single task force and then after it finishes its initial three years work, um, appointing new members and continuing its work on a new issue. Um, so so there, there are variety of ways to sort of address that. So this is really a broad scope, a very broad scope. Well, um, so it's, it's, this is narrowly focused on racial discrimination and it's, it's not getting at the issues of, for example, uh, the impact of eugenics on disabled populations in Vermont or the targeting of discrimination against uh, Italian immigrants in Barrie uh, or French Canadians in Vermont. Um, except to the extent that they may, that some of those individuals may be part of families that also belong to a group uh, that would be represented to in, in this task force here. So this is strictly racial or indigenous and tribal populations, yep. which could have been affected by any number of incidences throughout history in Vermont. Um, 
one last question because this is something we could debate for hours. Um, I'll switch gears. Are there other examples? You mentioned Bo Yang's position at the Human Rights Commission. Are there any other examples of an office like this that maintains an office space with a paid executive director, paid staff, um, and whatever else we would be paying for? Sure. Uh, so Green Mountain Care Board, the uh, Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, um, Vermont Student Assistance Corporation, um, the and then you know you can look at also other quasi independent boards like the Cannabis Control Board, where you know that that's an independent body within the executive branch. But is the Climate Council one also? Uh, yeah, the Climate Council is a little different, okay. though, I think. But, um, you know, I think like the Green Mountain Care Board, they have specific uh, authority. The Housing and Conservation Board, they have a specific, is probably even a better one because they have a specific mission uh, related to um, the development of housing and the conservation of land in Vermont. Um, and they have their separate budget, their separate legal authority. And so they're, they're sort of, they are, they operate within this building, but they're also independent from both this building and the fifth floor um, in carrying out their mission. Thank you. So. All right, I think we'll stop there. I think um, Representative Peggy, thank you for the last question, especially um, the flexibility or, or your penultimate question, because the flexibility of what this is, is the uh, I'm sorry, Representative Bloom, you had your hand up for a minute. Um, I, I think, I mean, you just got to it. And that I think that as um, we talked with any number of, of people, I think that they're, you know, who this process addresses <clears throat> and um, and how um, and how it the actual task force functions um, is, you know, for this committee to really debate and also for the task force then to determine too because um i you know it may well be that you have a task force that then kind of breaks into separate groups to pursue um uh different topics and that you know that so it, it's it's all kind of debatable and there isn't one right way um <laughs> That's partly our job and partly the task force job, as I understand it. Okay, we're going to um, stop work on this bill right now. Uh, take a seven or eight minute break till 1030. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Christie and Representative Colson for guests uh, for Thank guesting you. here today and visiting. And we will uh, be back at 1030 to take up um, Conversation on H329. We have uh, Susanna Davis with us to talk about that particular.